there folks and welcome back finance for managerial decision making this is professor Watts and today we're starting unit 2 which is about financial statement analysis so we'll start off with a brief lecture just reviewing the financial statements that we're going to be looking at now first off when we're talking about financial statements we should reference the accounting standards under which financial statements are put together in the United States we have what's known as a gap generally accepted accounting principles these are uh, rules based and they're issued by the Financial Accounting Standards Board, which is popularly known as FASB. Internationally, you have the International Financial Reporting Standards, which are more a principles-based system, and they're issued by the International Accounting Standards Board. Um, they are actually mostly the same, but there's a few differences. And just to give you some examples, GAAP allows for LIFO, which is last in, first out inventory accounting, and IFRS doesn't. Uh, GAAP does not allow for reversal of write-downs, whereas IFRS does. And those are just two of the bigger differences. Uh, there has been an attempt to converge everyone in the world to the same accounting standards, but there's a lot of cultural issues involved with accounting practices, so it's kind of hard to get uh, people across cultures and across countries to agree on one uh, set of rules for everything in the accounting realm. We're talking about any uh, substantial enterprise, any organization, we're, we're going to be looking at annual reports, and there are four elements to that. Income statements, balance sheet, statement of cash flows, and then the notes. And let me note that in the United States, public companies, which means they have shares of stock that are publicly owned, traded, are required by the Securities and Exchange Commission to file audited annual statements, that's known as the 10K, and then unaudited quarterly statements, that's known as the 10Q. Okay, so first up, the income statement, also known as profit and loss statement sometimes, or P&L. Hopefully you're all familiar with this if you've had some accounting. Okay, top line on the income statement is the revenue you get from operations. And then we're gonna subtract everything that is expenses. There's a whole bunch of different kinds of expenses that businesses accrue. Here we're reporting a few different measures of income. Income before interest and taxes, or EBIT. We could do income before taxes alone, which would just be EBT. And then once we've subtracted all the expenses, income and taxes and everything, so this is, uh, this is strictly the net income or the net profits of the operation. Okay, over here. So we had 15 million in, in revenue for this company, then the cost of goods sold, and then got, subtracting that gives us gross profit. Depreciation, which is a non-cash expense. We're gonna talk about that in a few minutes. So we really didn't have to pay for that in terms of writing checks or giving money out, but it's an expense we have to record nonetheless to properly account for the wear and tear on our fixed assets and our capital. Sales and administrative expenses here would be things like salaries paid to your, your sales and um, administrative workers. Okay, and we could refer to the, the net income there as operating income. Interest expense is tax, de tax deductible. Currently, that might change. There's actually tax reform in the works right now. We're recording this in the fall of 2017, so that could possibly change. But for now, that's tax deductible, so we're going to subtract it out. Then income before taxes, applying the tax rate. But anyway, when we get to the bottom line of the income statement, and you probably are familiar with these terms, okay, you know, what's the bottom line? Well, in an accounting sense, that's how much money did we actually make, $3,184,000. Okay. And then it looks like we're assuming this is a publicly held company with 4 million shares outstanding. We divided the total net income by the shares outstanding, so we got $0.80 cents per share earnings. This company is going to declare a little bit of a dividend, pay 400000 of the $3.1 million out. And therefore, the amount left over that's going to stay in the company and get reinvested is $2.7 million which is known as retained earnings. It's an increase to retained earnings. Okay, so now let's take a look at the balance sheet. The balance sheet, you'll recall from previous lectures, we've talked about this, assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity is the balance sheet equation. We uh, typically illustrate this with the T account, but the balance sheet's actual financial statement is just gonna be all listed in one, one column. And then as we've mentioned before, under the assets column, under the heading of assets, we're going to list it in order of decreasing liquidity. So the most liquid things first, cash, inventory, accounts receivable, and on down to the least liquid things like plant and equipment, which, you know, depending on how specific things are, might be really hard to sell. If you have um, mining equipment, for instance, that's really specialized for a certain type of soil or a certain type of rock formation, you know, there's only a few other companies in the world that would maybe be interested in buying it. And if your industry goes into a downturn, nobody wants to buy it. You got less liquid things down here. And then we subtract accumulated depreciation because depreciation is measuring how much of these assets get used up in the course of producing goods and services. And that, of course, reduces their value. Okay, and with liabilities, kind of similar to assets, we list them in, in order of currency. So you could think about the, the things that are due the soonest are listed first. Accounts payable right here 
are usually due within 30 days or so. Accrual short-term debt might be, you know, due within less than less than a year time frame, and then anything that's more than one year. So the cutoff here is going to be less than less than one year for current liabilities, and then greater than one year for long-term liabilities. Okay, so bonds. This would be bonds the firm has issued money it owes to bondholders. Long-term bank debt loans the company has taken from the bank. Mortgages that the company has taken against any of its properties. Preferred stock outstanding represents a claim by preferred stockholders to a guaranteed dividend payment. And then equity consists in this case of uh, stockholders equity, which is divided into two components. There's a, there's a par value of stock, which is just kind of an arbitrary valuation of the stock. And then the value, the current value of the stock, the difference between the par value and the current value which is known as capital in excess of par. And then retained earnings is cash that the firm has reinvested over time. And that could be over the over a period of, of years. You know, in the case of some large publicly held companies, they might have a retained earnings track re record going back uh, 100 years or more. Here's an example of balance sheet for the same organization, Acme Corporation. And you'll notice that this is a, a year end. So the balance sheet is a, is a point in time. The, the book says this is like a photograph, a snapshot. The income statement is more like a moving picture in that it captures the events that took place over the course of a year. The balance sheet looks at it at one moment in time, the end date of your accounting period, whereas the income statement measures everything that happened during the course of that accounting period. Okay, so here's our assets listed in declining liquidity. We've got some cash, we've got some securities. These are liquid because we could sell them today on the stock exchange or the bond market for their current value. Accounts receivable, we might not collect those for 30 or 60 or 90 days, but they're still gonna become mature. They're gonna turn into cash pretty soon. Okay. Inventory, we could theoretically sell that off in the in the near term. You know, in the course of normal operations, we're gonna sell some inventory, but if we needed to, we could sell some inventory to competitors maybe, or, or mark things down and, and liquidate inventory. So still pretty liquid. Okay. Prepaid expenses are just money we've paid for services we haven't received yet, such as insurance. You maybe pay a premium that lasts you all year or multiple years. And so we have to list that as an asset because it's, it's something of value that's coming to us. And then we add up the cur current assets here. And then we look at, we're looking at the long-term assets here. We just have one entry for that fixed assets. That would be equipment, plant, buildings, land, things like that. Minusing their accumulation. So we have our net fixed assets and then the current plus the total fix gives us the total. And then liabilities, again, the most current things first, accounts payable, notes payable, remember short-term. Accrued expenses would represent services we've used from suppliers, but we haven't paid them yet. And we haven't uh, actually received billing for it yet. So they would be similar to accounts payable, accounting-wise. We add up the total of current liabilities, and then we're looking at our long-term liabilities. This company only has one category there, long-term debt. And then we add those two totals together these two totals here rather to get to our total liabilities and then we're down at the equity portion of the balance sheet we have our par value of common stock capital in excess of par for we have a total what we would call the market cap the total value of the stock market capitalization you know, we hear this referred to in financial news as market cap for this company would be the sum of those two things so 16 million and then we've had a, a track record for the entire history of this company now of $10 million retained earnings. And then, of course, the total of assets has to equal the total of liabilities and equity, and it does. And if it doesn't, you're in trouble or you need to, to go back and check your books or make some adjustment entries. And of course, we're not going to really cover that because this is a finance class, not an accounting class. But we just want to be familiar with what is going on on the balance sheet. And what we're going to do pretty soon here in the next lesson is start to break down the company's performance by really almost exclusively calculating ratios and then comparing those ratios to benchmarks. And we can get a really good picture of how this company is operating in comparison to other companies within the industry, other companies in general, and so on. And I wanted to mention that if you're involved in, in financial analysis at all, and that, that could be within a, a bank or a financial institution, if you're a loan officer or a credit analyst or something like that, if you're an in investment if you're in the investment world, if you're analyzing companies to think about whether they're good investments or not, or even if you're just running, managing a small business, you need to be familiar with these financial statements and the analysis tools that we're going to be learning, ratio analysis, are gonna be pretty staple tools, pretty important tools for, for really for anyone. So, so this is really some basic stuff that you will find very useful, I think. 
Okay, now let's just do a little recap of the income statement in terms of the income statement equation. Revenues minus expenses equals net income. Revenues, of course, the, big, the biggie for any organization is going to be sales. But there's some other categories we should consider there. Investment income. Some firms have some spare cash that they're going to put into investments to earn some extra income on the side. Uh, capital gains on the investments need to be recognized as revenues. Interest received and dividends if the companies if the business owns stock in other companies, if the business puts money in the bank accounts or in the bond market. Okay, so all these kind of things would be recorded as revenues in the current period. And then expenses, cost of goods sold, of course, is the direct cost associated with the products we sold or services we sold. Salaries of administrative personnel, depreciation expenses, we'll talk more about this in a minute. That's actually a non-cash item. We have to record it to be to to fairly represent the expenses and therefore the net income but it's actually something you don't pay for and so, so it's a little odd taxes any other miscellaneous expenses interest paid and again that's that's a tax preferred expense but we have to record it for the basic accounting purposes and the net income is always going to consist of dividends plus retained earnings if you're a small enterprise that doesn't have stockholders you might not have uh, dividends or even sometimes large companies have millions of stockholders, billions of shares outstanding, but they won't pay dividends. Well, that means all the net income, if it's positive, is going to be retained and reinvested into the company, used for uh, further investment in assets or further operating expenses. If it's negative, it's a reduction in retained earnings. And of course, it reduces the assets of the company and the equity of the company. OK, so finally, we'll get to the statement of cash flows. And this one's going to be one of the most important ones for the field of finance, and it kind of distinguishes finance from accounting. Accountants are more interested typically in the, the income statement, whereas financial analysts are, more in, are typically more interested in the statement of cash flows. And so the, the equation is pretty simple. Cash inflow minus cash outflow equals change in cash. We are, of course, typically hoping that that's positive. We want more cash inflow than cash outflow, but there are some instances in which you could have a net cash outflow, and that doesn't necessarily mean your business is in trouble because there's some little quirky things about how cash flow operates. Okay, so let's break down the changes in cash flows that can happen in th from three different categories, operations, financing, and investing. From operations, of course, we get cash from sales. When we make sales, people pay us, so that one's pretty obvious. Depreciation expenses actually add to cash flow. Now, I know that one's kind of confusing because there's there's no cash associated with depreciation. But what we're talking about is, if I'm back to the income statement and we're thinking about the depreciation expense here. We had $2 million worth of wear and tear on our equipment. Now, that's probably derived from a depreciation schedule. So it's just kind of really just a rounded kind of averaged out number, but we'll, but we'll run with it. We never wrote anyone a check for $2 million, yet we marked down our income by that two million dollars well that is that is not a cash outflow and so ca the net cash we received is actually going to be two million dollars higher than what net income says it is so when we come back to the statement of cash flows we're going to have to add back depreciation expense now when we collect accounts receivable accounts receivable are things we already recorded as income but didn't get any cash for them so that that's something that's in the income statement as income but we actually didn't get cash, so when we collect it, we have to add that back to the cash flows. And then decreasing inventory represents sales that aren't expensed to cost of goods sold. So in other words, we, we produce some products in past years, they've been sitting on the shelves, and then we sell them. Now this, the net income part is recorded in the sales, but the fact that we didn't expense them against current against the what we produced in the current period means that we actually have, a, have to add back the value of the inventory part, the, what would be the cost of goods part, uh, back into the cash flow statement separately. Okay, so there's some kind of quirky little adjustments you have to make. Recording things that actually uh, did not cause cash outflows or were, or were not recognized as cash inflows. Okay, then on the outflow side, of course, payments to people, to suppliers and salaries, this would be operating expenses. So th those ones are obvious, I, th I should think. Increase in accounts receivable. Well, that represents income we've booked in the income statement. So we're going to carry over the net income here. But we actually didn't get paid for it yet. It's just a receivable. We're waiting to get paid for it. So when, when, it, when it comes to cash flow, we have to subtract that because that's income that we haven't really received in, in the form of hard currency yet. Decrease in payables. That's not captured in the income statement. We just paid down our accounts payable. What does that mean? It means we 
wrote people checks, so the cash went down, so that has to be subtracted. And then any accruals, accruals are kind of similar to payables. If we paid them, that means we actually used up cash. So those things have to be adjusted in that way. Okay, so once we make all those adjustments, we get to the, the net actual change in cash. And again, that's more what the, the financial analysts care about because they want to see, well, you know, if we're talking about credit analysts, they want to see if the firm has enough cash, is generating enough cash to, to pay its interest obligations. Okay, now there's a few other categories of adjustments for, to the cash flows. Investing operations, anytime we sell fixed assets, that's not really income from operations. It, it is going to be a separate category of income, so we add that into cash flow for obvious reasons. And then when we purchase other assets or other firms, use cash typically, that's going to um, go against cash flows. And then finally, the financing operations effect on cash flow. Anytime we sell stock, we're getting cash. Anytime we issue debt, we're getting cash or borrow money. And so we want to add those things in. And anytime we buy back stock, we have to pay with cash, repay debt, we have to pay with cash, pay dividends and interest have to be paid in cash typically. So that represents an outflow. So statement of cash flows is doing a lot of uh, sometimes quir quirky and, and complicated things, but it's ultimately getting us to what was the actual change in our company's cash holdings from the beginning of this period to the end. And here's an example for the same company from the book. Okay, so we start with our net income. That's always the starting point in our statement of cash flows. And then we add back the depreciation expense, as we noted. We had a, here an increase in accounts receivable. So that's money we that's included in the net income because that's, that's sales we've made. So we're going to book them in the income statement, but we didn't actually get the cash yet. So we have to subtract that money. Okay. We decreased inventory. So you can basically think about this as we, we sold things that we expensed in previous periods and now they've, they've just been sitting on the shelves. And so when we sell them, the inventory value component is a cash inflow for this period. Okay, we decreased marketable securities, which means we sold them. So we that's some extra income that's not accounted in, in the operating income. Uh, we didn't have any change in prepaids. We had a decrease in accounts payable. Doesn't affect income at all. We just paid some accounts payable with our cash. And so we have to subtract that change. And then likewise, we had a decrease in accrued expenses. Didn't affect income at all, but we used our own cash to, to pay those down. So we have to subtract that. So we, while we earned 3 million, 3.1 million for this company, we actually had a 9 million increase in cash, right? And that's because we had more things added back to cash flow from operating than we actually had cash outlays for operating. And then with investments, we only had one entry here. We increased our fixed assets. We expanded our plant and equipment quite a bit. So we, we spent 14 million on that. And then finally, our financing activities, we, uh, we did increase our debt some, and we might've actually used this increase in debt to partially finance this here. Uh, we issued some extra stock. So we got money from those two operations, of course. Uh, we paid off some notes that had to come out of our cash, although it didn't affect income from operations. We also paid some dividends. And so our total cash there increased in 5 million, mostly because we either issued more stock or loaned or borrowed more money than we paid off things. And therefore total increase in cash or total change in cash is a $1 million increase. After all is said and done, we earned $3 million. Okay. We had a lot of ups and downs in cash flows. And we have a 1 million increase in cash at the end of the year. Now, is that good or bad part? Well, the answer is kind of, that depends. On the surface, it looks pretty good. We we made three million dollars. We paid some dividends. We reduced some some liabilities. We still have an increase in a million cash after we made all these investments. So on the surface, my preliminary assessment is saying, hey, this company's doing pretty well. But to really get into kind of the nuts and bolts of how well the company's doing, we're going to go deeper into all three of the statements and develop some ratio analysis, and we'll be able to kind of compare how this company's doing against some some benchmarks that are either just rules of thumb standards or compare it to other companies within its industry, and then we can get a more refined evaluation of this company's performance. So stay tuned, and in lecture five, we'll be diving into financial statement analysis.